Transformation is a potent word, a powerful concept. But what does it mean in relation to a society? Can the spiritual DNA of a community really be altered? If so, what kind of features does this new blueprint produce? In this program, we'll attempt to answer these and other important questions. We'll visit several communities whose streets and institutions have lately been rattled by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll examine both the causes and the effects of this most impressive phenomenon. To take us on this journey, we join noted investigative researcher George Otis Jr., a man who spent years reading signposts on the road to community transformation. Community transformation is a concept that many Christians struggle with. But where does this tentativeness come from? My own observation is that it derives largely from the limitations of our own life experience. If you ask believers if they've experienced spiritual revival, most will say yes. Ask if they're convinced that large-scale church growth can happen, and they will invariably cite specific examples. But what almost no one has experienced, at least in the Western world, is a profound and pervasive transformation of their community. And as a result, we're inclined to think it's unattainable. But is this a valid assumption? I'd like to invite you to journey with me to four communities that have been dramatically altered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Four communities that offer a shining example of what can happen when God comes to town. was well known as the drug capital of the world. And along with that, all the violence and corruption, sin of every kind you can imagine. The violence was getting worse. The church was really feeling the pressure of what was going on. So here in the Amazon, which is the Colombia Amazon, Brazilian Amazon, and Peruvian Amazon, this is where many of the laboratories, cocaine laboratories oh, yeah. are. Marcy and Randy McMillan are veteran ministers who have lived in Cali more than 20 years. At least 10 of them have been spent in the shadow of the city's infamous drug lords. They've seen the devastating effects of the cartel's ruthless control, and they've seen it right in their own backyard. When illicit drug money began pouring into Cali in the 1980s, the cocaine lords moved into the McMillan's upscale neighborhood buying up entire blocks of luxurious haciendas. Hey, Randy, uh, this is uh, an unbelievable place here over to the right. This yes. wall looks like it's 20 to 25 feet high. Who lived here? The Orjuela Rodriguez family, which are heads of the Cali cartel. During that period of uh, their control over the country and cocaine and exportation involving, they said it, you know, 500 million a month. What, Whoa. The, what they were doing every month, just on a regular month. That's I mean, unbelievable. Without any, yeah, without anything special. And during that time, I mean, security and walls were everything for them. I mean, paranoia, um, paranoia, huh? fear. For years, Colombia was the world's biggest exporter of cocaine, sending upwards of 1,000 tons a year to the United States and Europe. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency called the Cali Cartel the largest, richest, and best organized criminal organization in history. With billions of dollars at their disposal, their reach was pervasive, especially in Cali itself. They really controlled the whole socioeconomic situation, the political situation, and even very much the religious. Terrible. It was terrible. At that time, drug trafficking in Cali was one of the most powerful in the world. People would die easily. If you were riding around in a car and there was a confrontation, it was a miracle if you or the driver weren't killed. And people walked around full of fear. I personally saw five people killed in Cali. There were many journalists who were killed for denouncing what the mafia was doing in Colombia. Importing political decisions for the country were manipulated by drug trafficking money, influencing all aspects of society. It touched everything, absolutely everything. You know, have, this is just one of 1,200 properties that they had in Cali. 
to freely walk the streets that once held so much terror is testimony to the remarkable changes that have come to Cali. But where did it all begin? This story, like all transformation accounts, is rooted in the hearts of intercessors, men and women who had ears to hear what God was saying. God spoke to us that we should come to Cali. Ruth Royball and her husband Julio came to Cali in 1978. They were dismayed at the utter darkness that had settled over the city. But Julio was convinced that if the people of God would join together and pray, the enemy's grip would be broken. There was just one problem. No one wanted to do this. It wasn't really unity among the churches. You did your thing, and I say, God bless you, brother, and, and have a wonderful time in your church, but this is my church, and this is what I do. The pastor's association used to consist of nothing more than a box of files. Every pastor was working separately on his own. No one would join together. Following a disagreement, Julio pulled out of the already weak pastor's association. But then he realized he was contributing to the disunity. God spoke to him and told him, you don't have the right to be offended. And you have to forgive. And he took that message and he realized, he said, if I'm going to reflect Jesus, I cannot be uh, offended in any way. Julio went back to the pastors and begged their forgiveness. They could not afford to walk in disunity, not when their city faced such overwhelming challenges. We started realizing, well, what hope do we have? We had all these international organizations plus all the Colombian authorities against the Cali cartel and nothing ever happened. So being concerned for this, we started praying and interceding and asking the Lord to show us how to pray. And that's how he took us to understand our spiritual roots. To gain God's perspective on their city, local churches began to examine the spiritual dynamics in their immediate neighborhoods. One of the things we would do was, uh, Randy would give out maps of the city and the government has it divided like in different areas, zones. And within those zones there are many neighborhoods, so we would divide the church up into these zones and according to the neighborhood where they lived, then they had to bring back information of all of the problems that they saw that were occurring, that were reoccurring, very strong problems within their area. One troubling discovery was the city's deep involvement with the occult. Even the macho drug lords were active clients of mediums and spiritual guides. They had very strong roots of occultic practices, and that was mixed in with the religious leadership, and that gave them power, aside from the power that they already had with their money. As they began to address specific strongholds over the city, Cali's pastors felt God leading them to assemble their people for an evening of joint worship and prayer. At the beginning, the problem was people saying, it won't work, the people might not come. And many opposed it, but we had leaders that dared to do things. They dared, understanding that it was God's will. In 95, we had our first all-night prayer meeting. Did you feel the mountains tremble? And they prayed against principalities and powers. They prayed for unity. They believed in God to see him move in the churches. The mayor at that time got on the platform, prayed for Kali and said, Kali belongs to Jesus Christ. And with those words, when the Christians heard them from the city authority, that was a confirmation of what the Holy Spirit was doing in the city. 48 hours after the event, the daily newspaper headlined, No Homicides. For the first time in as long as anyone could remember, Cali had gone an entire weekend without a single murder. A newsworthy event in a city used to seeing upwards of 15 killings per day. After these major prayer events, united prayer events were going on, that's when we started seeing the results. And 10 days later, the first drug lord fell, and God was changing the city. Encouraged by the spiritual momentum generated by the first all-night prayer vigil, church leaders decided to rent the largest venue in the city 
the 55,000 seat Pascual Guerrero Soccer Stadium. Their faith was amply rewarded when more than 60,000 believers showed up to pray and worship across denominational lines. During the summer of 1995, the Colombian government declared all-out war against the drug lords. 6,500 elite commandos were dispatched to Cali with explicit orders to round up the cartel's ringleader. There were seven uh, top drug lords, six had fallen in those nine months when we really started praying together. The whole spiritual atmosphere of the city of Cali has changed. While Julio was encouraged by God's handiwork, he faced opposition in his own backyard. A neighbor, angry over disputed property rights, threatened to kill him. So Julio said, I'm going to fast and pray until I know what's happening. So he was fasting, and on the third day, God spoke to him, and he said, he will do you great damage. But from what he does, the revival in Cali will spring forth. I want to tell you people, this is a very dangerous thing that we're doing here tonight. He had a meeting with the pastor's association, the board. I was waiting for him with the other pastors at 2 o'clock that afternoon. He told us to drop him off. The chauffeur kept saying, no, let me take you to the door. Let me wait with you. But I said, no, just, just leave me here. I can walk. He got out. He started walking towards the church. Two hitmen were waiting in ambush for him. Last time I saw him. I got a call and they said, they just killed Julio. And I said, nah, how can they kill a pastor? So I went to the place thinking he was just hurt. But when I got there, he was lying on his side like a baby. Julio, the noisy one, the active one, the man who just never sat still, there he was lying like a baby. When they first told me about it, it's, you're in shock. You can't believe it really happened. And as I arrived, his body was still on the street. There was a pool of blood by his head where he'd been shot. The verse that came to me just by the Spirit of God was precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of the saints. And as I just stepped out and sat next to his body, I knew where I was on holy ground. And I just said, Lord, I know that you know everything in our hearts, mm. but this I have to say, it is well with my soul. Mm. This is what you wanted, mm. and it's well with my mm. soul. In shock and struggling to understand God's purposes in this tragedy, hundreds of Christians gathered at Julio's funeral, including many pastors who had not even been speaking to each other. and all the pastors came forward and we embraced each other and we made a covenant of unity saying that we would not let things get between us. Today, this covenant of unity extends to some 200 pastors and serves as the backbone of the city's high-profile prayer vigils. It has led to an absolute transformation to this city. Corruption has been reduced dramatically. The, the cocaine drug cartels have been shattered in this city. There are about 60,000 people, and they've come here to spend the entire night praying that God would continue the marvelous work he has been doing in this city for 36 consecutive months. While thousands of exuberant worshipers lit up the inside of the stadium, Staff security was forced to turn away an additional 15,000 participants at the gate. Undaunted, the latecomers formed an impromptu praise march that circled the stadium for hours. What you're seeing here today in this stadium is, is a miracle. Uh, you know that some years ago it would have been impossible for evangelicals to gather like this, but, but God is raising up his church. Hallelujah. And, and Hallelujah. we're going to meet that need in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is what's happening Hallelujah. today in Colombia. This is something that pastors and intercessors in the United States, in Europe, all over the world need to witness. This is what God is doing in our day. And we can see that God's a mighty
kingdom of God has descended upon Cali, many prominent citizens have come into relationship with Christ. Rafael Araujo Gámez is Colombia's leading sports commentator. For years, he's broadcast championship soccer matches from the stadium. I am here today because six months ago, I came to know Jesus, and I accepted him as my savior. I have been worshiping him and praising him ever since. How does the excitement of what's going on in the Vigilia compare to the soccer matches? There is no comparison. With the soccer games, it's just a lot of yelling and screaming. Here you enjoy it from the heart. Are, are you a pretty happy man the last six months? Usted es un hombre bien feliz en esos últimos seis meses. Yes, diferente, gozoso, muy uh, joyous, muy gozoso. Very different. I have been changed. I am very sí, joyful. Sí, sí. Joyful. It's a different life. <laughs> Mario Hinete is a prominent attorney and motivational speaker whose radio program is heard throughout Latin America. After searching for peace in various New Age and self-help organizations, he finally came home to Christ. From that moment on, I started to find a real peace inside of me. I definitely believe that even though I'm a spiritual baby, the answer is here in the Bible. I feel I lost 41 years of my life, but I know now that God has a plan for me. Mario's new passion is to learn the ways of God and serve him through the media. I understand that God is saying to me, it's not the way you want it, it's the way I want it. And I say, yes, so be it, Lord, is what you want. But use me. I want to serve you. For the unsaved people, all of a sudden they're coming to the place, hey, oh, what do we have here? Where are we going? What hope is there? There's corruption here. There's fraud there. There's every place they look, there's, it's always coming up to a dead end. And all of a sudden they're saying, there's got to be an answer. There's got to be an answer. And, and you combine that with the church saying, there is an answer. There is an answer and you've got an explosion coming. Even city officials acknowledge the positive effects of the gospel. The government officials were saying to the president of the Pastors Association, hey, listen, you know, we, we need more of you guys uh, in the government. We need honest people like you guys. And the mayor had said, I can't charge you for, for using the stadium because you're doing us a favor. So now they're looking at the church like, we are bringing something positive. When local churches wanted to offer a spiritual alternative to Cali's traditional fair, a 10-day event usually accompanied by drunken debauchery, city officials agreed. Not only would they give the Christians rent-free use of the 22,000-seat velodrome, they would also pay for the advertising, sound support, and security. This new openness to the gospel is affecting all levels of society. Nowadays, it is no longer viewed as strange to have the Lord in our daily lives. Upper-class people are accepting that Jesus is a need in their lives, and they don't view it as something ridiculous, because before they thought it was a joke. That was the worst thing that you could bring up in a conversation. Nowadays, you can speak about God, and everybody will respect it and is interested. Explosive church growth is happening all over the city, across denominational lines. Ask pastors to define their strategy and they say, we don't have time to plan. We're too busy pulling the nets into the boat. And the numbers are growing. One church hosts more than 35,000 people. They can't all fit all at once. So what they do on Sunday, they have seven uh, services. They start, they have one at 7 in the morning, one at 9 in the morning, one at 11, at 1, at 3, at 5, and at 7 at night. It has, it has really been an explosion, especially and, in this church. And, and is this happening in some other churches in the city as well? It's happening in other churches that are also, almost every church in Cali is growing. There's a hunger for God everywhere. I mean, you can see it in the buses, on the streets. Uh, you can talk to anybody anywhere you go. Church leaders believe this spiritual hunger is a direct result of their unity and fervent prayer. It's a process that continues with repentance and reconciliation, sweeping away barriers to evangelism. I believe that now the church is very united and that it is not just these problems that have made the people draw closer to God, but it is God himself moving in the city. It is interesting that the Lord picked the city of Cali, a city that was 
controlled and manipulated by uh, illegal monies, by drug lords, by corruption. That would be the most unlikely city that you would pick. And yet, God picked the city of Cali. And I believe that God did that purposefully to show the entire world and the leadership of the cities of this world that God can transform a community uh, if the community repents. The revival Julio prophesied before his death has begun. As his family celebrates the church's newfound unity and the throngs of people coming eagerly to Christ, they are comforted and honored to have played a part. And we realized that God had entrusted to us the greatest thing that anybody could ever do, and that's give the very closest as a martyr for Jesus Christ. And we realized that put a big responsibility upon us as well, to exalt his name in this, because we knew that God was doing something greater. With his death, it's like it encouraged us to, to, like, to want to do the same, to lay down our lives for the Lord, and not just die for him, but to live for him. That, can be harder than dying for him. So Do you, you feel like some of that vision that your your father had is is, is living on through you? It's yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. very much a part of us. Julio used to say, I am immortal until I've done everything God has for me to do. And if you had asked Julio, if you could talk to him now and say, was it worth it? He would say yes, because that's where his heart was. What everyone thought was impossible. What everyone thought was totally, virtually, humanly impossible, I, I bear witness before God and you this evening that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. I think God is doing something new, not only in the city of Cali, not only in the nation of Colombia, but all across the face of the earth today. If this is what the church has to look forward to in the years ahead, I want to be a part of it. Kiambu was a town which had very bad history. In fact, it had the worst history in our country. The murder in terms of rape, violence, it was well known. This town was not growing. The churches were not growing. Because of the bad reputation of the town, nobody wanted to come. By the late 1980s, this distressed suburb of Nairobi had become one of the most dangerous and oppressive places in Kenya. Bars and illicit stills outnumbered churches and grocery stores. Fueled by a river of alcohol, Kiambu's crime rate rose to worst in the nation. Nobody, especially women, dared venture out after dark. Civil servants routinely paid bribes to avoid assignments in Kiambu. Despite years of effort in this town of 65,000, no church had ever been able to grow beyond a few dozen members. As one weary pastor put it, we preach the gospel here, but the people don't get saved. The Lord spoke to me and my wife back in 1988 and told us to come, that is Kiambu, and uh, to plant a church. Itinerant ministers Thomas and Margaret Muthi weren't exactly thrilled when God called them to the town of Kiambu. They knew church planting in this notorious ministry graveyard would not be easy. In fact, ministry colleagues in Nairobi thought the whole idea was crazy, and they didn't hesitate to say so. But the Muthis realized that to be successful, they would need to identify and confront the source of Kiambu's spiritual oppression. We find the Bible saying in Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities. So uh, our problem was not the people in the town. Our problem was, what is the devil doing to the people? Why is he keeping them the way they are? For six months, the Muthis committed themselves to fervent prayer and diligent research. So we asked God, what's the root cause? We prayed, we fasted. The Lord showed us a spirit of witchcraft resting over the place. They discovered that many of the things going on in Kiambu were linked to a powerful woman named Mama Jane, 
Although she pretended to be a Christian and even called her divination house Emmanuel Clinic, her business was pure witchcraft. Mama Jane's clientele included the town's top business and political leaders who came to have their fortunes told. Realizing that Kiambu was in the grip of powerful, evil forces, the Muthis began to press in to God. And at the end of six months, uh, we got an assurance in our spirits. The spiritual power over the town had been broken. <laughs> Seizing this window of opportunity, Thomas conducted his first outdoor crusade. By the end of the first week, more than 200 people had committed their hearts to Christ. Soon, healings and conversions were commonplace. When the municipal hall could no longer accommodate the crowds, Thomas moved his congregation into the basement of a nearby grocery store. Filled with round-the-clock intercession, it was promptly dubbed the Prayer Cave. Distressed by these developments, Mama Jane began to counterattack through targeted witchcraft. A thick oppression descended upon prayer and worship services. It remained until elders discovered Mama Jane's handiwork outside the church. Realizing they were dealing with demonic influences, the believers took authority over the situation. Just raised up our hands one morning, and we prayed that she either got saved or leaves town. Within days, Mama Jane was stripped of her power. Within weeks, she packed up and left town. Once this power of witchcraft, the principality that was over, Kiambu, was broken, then the presence of God started to hover around the town. The entire atmosphere changed. Where once people used to be afraid to go out at night, Kiambu now enjoys one of the lowest crime rates in the country. Local bars have been closed and remodeled into churches. The town has flourished. We have seen actual change. And with the presence of God, of course, there comes a lot of changes. Favors, prosperity, that's what we are seeing today. Now that Kiambu has a good name, people from Nairobi are flocking to get houses there. The population is up by 30%. There has also been a dramatic increase in the number of conversions. The Kiambu Prayer Cave, otherwise known as the Word of Faith Church, has expanded to more than 5,000 members. Not bad in the town where congregations previously averaged only 30 to 40 people. We are seeing God do great things in this town. We are seeing lives changed. Criminals coming to Jesus, prostitutes, robbers, all kinds of people coming to Jesus. As Thomas is quick to point out, the recipe for continued success must also include prayer. Prayer is communicating with God. It's not simple. It's talking to God who has the power to change situations. Now, there is so much prayer in this place that helps us, that way it helps us to not only maintain what we, have, we gain, but also to gain more ground. Each day, more than 400 intercessors gather to pray. The routine begins at 6 a.m. They call it their morning glory. This is supplemented by Friday night prayer vigils and Wednesday evening gatherings called Operation Prayer Storm. Prayer generates a power that I mean is extraordinary. It's a power that transforms. I've seen it transform the city. If God can do it in Kiambu, he can do it anywhere in the world.
this town was in serious trouble. Lots of Satanism, uh, witchcraft, uh, we had the Moonies in the valley, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, TM, Transcendental Meditation Facilities, the Church of Scientology. We discovered that we were uh, methamphetamine manufacturing capital of the West Coast. There was a spirit of competition that reigned and ruled within not just the churches, but at the head of those churches within the pastors. For years, this sleepy retirement community near the San Jacinto Mountains was known as a pastor's graveyard. People came to the valley to live out a life of ease, and they wanted to be left alone. But underneath this laid-back lifestyle, there lurked a dark side. The community's uh, problems had an underlying spiritual basis to them, and the valley was very seated in cult and occultic activity. Cults weren't the only problem. Neighborhood youth gangs had played the Hemet suburb of San Jacinto for decades. Pastor Gordon Houston's San Jacinto Assembly of God Church sits on the very street that's home to the town's notorious First Street Gang. There are kids whose dads and grandfathers were a part of the First Street Gang. And so this is something that has perpetuated itself throughout the generations, literally. The danger was so great around the First Street area the police refused to go there without substantial backup. We got a phone call in the middle of the night. It was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Gordon experienced firsthand the gang's destructive nature when his church was vandalized one night. And at the base on the inside, there was this large pool of blood. I mean, it was massive. And that is when the police told us who it was that had broken this window. It was one of the family members of the home right across the street who was the central part of the gang structure here in San Jacinto. It turns out the Hemet Valley was also a major drug center. At least nine methamphetamine labs operated out of the area, each benefiting from the dry climate, remote location, and friendly law enforcement. I've actually had law enforcement officers transport methamphetamine for me. In their, in their in their police cars. Sonny often cooked up enough meth in a given month to supply more than a million people. Much of the deadly powder was trucked out of town disguised as forms of sheetrock. Hemet's spiritual turnaround did not come easily. Neither the Becketts nor the Houstons were early Valley enthusiasts. And I never really wanted to be there. I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, 18 miles from the closest freeway in a valley. My wife and I, Susan and I, had our emotional bags packed all the time, waiting for the day that God would somehow call us out of this valley. The Houstons didn't even unpack their bags when they arrived in town. We, were, we had our little baby, six-month-old baby, in a pinot runabout with no air conditioning and vinyl seats. And we drove down the street, we looked at the church and said, oh, thank you. God began to speak to my wife and I speak to me one day and said, would you spend the rest of your life in this valley for me? And God couldn't have asked a worse question of me. Uh, would I spend the rest of my life in a valley I didn't love, I didn't care for, I didn't want to be a part of? And God said, no, I've got a plan. I have got a plan if you will make a commitment to this place. The Becketts silenced the voices urging them to leave Hemet by purchasing a cemetery plot on the edge of town. And I said, unless Jesus comes back, you know, this is my land, I'm starting, my commitment is right here. Filled with a new passion for his community, Beckett joined several men for a night of prayer and fasting in a nearby mountain cabin. It proved to be a powerful experience. We knew we had touched something in the realm of the spirit that would be very significant for our valley. It was at that point things began to escalate spiritually. Researchers started to feed intercessors fresh information on the problems plaguing the community. The intercessors in our church have been able to use spiritual mapping to help them focus on issues. If you don't know where the problem is, you can't evaluate it. Spiritual mapping brings us to a place of knowledge and information. If I have a, a base of issues that I know are strongholds within my city, then God has the ability to speak something into my heart to say, gather the intercessors and go after this now. Soon, a chorus of informed intercession was yielding impressive results. Cult membership, once a serious threat, has sunk to less than three-tenths of a percent of the population. 
the Church of Scientology is still present, but many other groups are long gone. The Transcendental Meditation Training Center was literally burned out. Shortly after believers prayed for its removal, a brush fire started in the mountains on the west side of the valley. It burned only the TM facility and didn't touch any of the buildings on either side. Gangs are another success story. When I started here, uh, guys working graveyard or swing shift, we could camp out at the, on Main Street where the bars are and just go from one fight to another and taking people to jail all night long. And now that doesn't happen anywhere like it used to. Not long ago, a leader of the First Street Gang burst down the center aisle of Gordon Houston's church during a morning worship service. So I'm standing up preaching and here comes this, this gang member and tattooed up and he's walking right to the platform with some pretty intense force and I didn't know what was going on and so I kind of kept preaching until he got real close and, and uh, he just stopped and he looked up at me and he said, I want to get saved right now. Soon, all the inhabitants of the notorious First Street Gang House were converted, and one of their first outward acts was to remove graffiti from vandalized church walls. And we prayed, asking God to allow the opportunity to see their family come to the Lord, to see their kids get out of drugs and get saved. And you know, God did it. The entire family, all the kids, everybody wow. came to know the Lord. Wow. They got out of the drug activity and wow. the gang activity. And uh, it's really changing. It's really amazing to see the change, you know. According to Sonny, Hemet's drug trade has dropped by as much as 75%. He gives much of the credit to intercessors. They took a multi-million dollar drug corporation and made it run with its tail between its legs. Sonny himself was apprehended by the Holy Spirit en route to commit a murder. Driving to meet his intended victim, he felt something take control of the steering wheel. He wound up in the parking lot of Bob Beckett's Dwelling Place Church. Well, I got out of the car and I got a pistol laying on the seat, covered up with a blanket with a silencer on it. And um, I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? And so I end up walking into this prayer meeting and um, it was all over from that moment on. That was the beginning of Sonny's journey home, a journey he says was brought about through prayer. If God can do that for me, he can do it for anybody, because I was out there. And this town's got a lot of people in it praying. Drug dealers and gang members aren't the only ones getting saved in the Hemet Valley. Church attendance now stands at about 14%, double what it was just 10 years ago. We licked up a shot. A victory shout We've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our mouth Now we have a, a professing mayor, a professing police chief, professing fire chief, professing uh, a city manager, uh, down through the ranks. Lately, everybody's conversation to me has been, I don't know how you do it. How do you do it? Because the attack is great. I feel God called me to this, and he hasn't told me to quit yet, or he hasn't shut the door. Instead, I see him opening doors to more churches, more people, more Christians, to really bring them together and say, you know, you want Christians in leadership, so now you have them. Now you have to support them, and the only way to support them is through prayer. Beckett estimates about 30% of local law enforcement and an exceptional number of high school teachers, coaches, and principals are now believers. In fact, for the past several years, nearly 85% of all school district staff candidates have been Christians. You, you name it, God has just turned the school system around and to the point where we used to be one of the laughingstock school districts where nobody wanted to send their kids to school in the San Jacinto School District. Now our students have some of the highest academic ratings and, the and one of the lowest dropout ratings in all of the Western United States. And the school and all parts of the community have become a place where uh, everybody works together and, and it's a spiritual place and we've taken on the battles of <laughs> the dark side and, and drawn the line and said uh, that we're going to reclaim the community and that's what we're about all working together. And the churches in the valley are no longer squabbling, but are coming together in unity. Now we're becoming, as churches, a wall of living stones. Now churches aren't competing. 
swapping pulpits with one another. They had Baptist and Pentecostal pulpits and vice versa and Lutherans with Episcopalians and, and it's changed the life of the church. It's begun to build a fabric instead of loose yarn. Recently, several dozen Hemet area churches co-sponsored a Convoy of Hope where thousands of residents received free food, clothing, and medical exams. They also got a good dose of God's love. It's probably, without a doubt, one of the greatest things to hit our valley in recent years. This is what church is all about. It's not about sitting inside the four walls of our building. It's about going in and touching the lives of people where they are. Attracted to this proactive love, more than 300 people gave their hearts to Christ. This has been so phenomenal. I've just been blown away by the number of people who have come, who have responded. This is something that just couldn't be done but with one church. It, had, it took us all to be able to do this. I'm not just going to be held accountable for how I treated my church. I'm going to be held accountable by God for how did I pastor my city. And now the atmosphere in our city has completely turned. We recognize that it's building people, it's not building a church. This is not a church growth issue. This is a kingdom growth issue. And here we see that God's moving. The time of Jubilee is coming. When young and old return to Jesus. Himmet's not a perfect town. Uh, probably never will be, but Himmet is definitely in the process of transformation. Transformation is taking place. It is not the same community it was in the past. Amalinga was an extremely poor village. This was a community in total poverty and alcohol addiction. Violence, ignorance, witchcraft, their cult, idol worshiping. A few kilometers will be entering the town of Almalonga. The city's 20-some thousand inhabitants have made a conscious choice to sever the continuum with ancestral spirit worship. As a consequence, Almalonga is today one of the cleanest, most prosperous towns in all of Guatemala. It's a city of churches. Many cite Almalonga as a world-class example of community transformation. It may very well be. As many as 8 out of 10 residents now consider themselves born-again Christians. But it hasn't always been like this. Just 20 years ago, Almalonga was a dark and dangerous place. Suffered from poverty, violence, ignorance, and besides that, alcohol was the main problem. If you would go to Almalonga 20 years ago in the morning, 7 a.m., and walk the streets of Almalonga, you would have encountered many, many men just lying on the street because they were totally drunk. We had many jails because there were so many problems. Chief of Police Donato Santiago recalls that people were always fighting. Officials built four jails, but even they couldn't contain the problem. Overflow prisoners were routinely bused to a nearby city. Domestic violence was especially pronounced. I talked to a woman who said that her husband would, uh, if, she, if he didn't like the meal, that uh, she, she would uh, be beaten and just kicked out of the home. Pastor Mariano Rescaje, one of the key leaders of Al Malonga's spiritual turnaround, has similar memories. I was raised in misery. My father sometimes drank for 40 to 50 straight days. We never had a big meal, only a little tortilla with a small glass of coffee. My parents spent what little money they had on alcohol. In an effort to ease their suffering, many townspeople made packs with folk deities like Pascual Bailon, the Lord of Death, and Mashimon, a powerful patron saint. Uh, Mashimon, he was the most important idol in Almolonga. When the Spaniards came to Guatemala 500 years ago, uh, they found that the indigenous people, they, they were willing to, to negotiate certain things. 
There was one thing they were not willing to, to do any deal about, and that was Mashimo. That was too important an item for them. This syncretism created a powerful stronghold. Although Mashimon took on the form of a wooden mannequin, the spirit behind the idol held tenacious power over the people of Al Malanga. It's just a wooden mask, but it's very powerful, a terrible stronghold that binds people. During these dark days, the gospel did not fare well. Outside evangelists were commonly chased away with sticks or rocks, while small local house churches were also stoned. Evangelical Christians were a despised minority. On one occasion, six men shoved a gun barrel down Mariano's throat. As they began to pull the trigger, he silently petitioned the Lord for protection. When the hammer fell, nothing happened. Delivered from death, Pastor Riscaje called his small flock into prayer. It was time to break the stranglehold of violence, superstition, and poverty. As the intercessors lifted their petitions heavenward, they were filled with a supernatural faith. We told the Lord, it is not possible that we could be so insignificant when your word says we are heads and not tails. We kept fasting three or four days a week, and every Saturday we held a prayer vigil. And that was what I think opened the door. People started to be delivered, men started to be saved and come to church. It was a tremendous, tremendous blessing. A revival, I would call it. And then after uh, many signs and wonders started taking place and, and uh, a lot of mass deliverances from demonic oppression, um, churches started growing. Is it true to die that when people pray cloudless skies will break kings and queens will shake One dramatic healing involved a woman named Teresa. A botched medical procedure had led to the onset of gangrene. Her internal organs were literally rotting. I was in a lot of pain, so much that I couldn't walk. My whole body was paralyzed and I couldn't even eat or talk. She was very sick and her condition got worse with every passing day. There was nothing we could do, so we decided to arrange her funeral because there was no hope for her. The house was filled with family members and neighbors had gathered outside. Everyone thought she was dying. The smell of death was everywhere. They called me to arrange the funeral, and on the way there, the Lord told me to pray for her. So I just went up to her bed and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. And she rose up instantly with no sickness in her body. I felt a warmth, and I saw a bright light above me. Then I opened my eyes, and I saw the pastor. I rejoice before the Lord for my healing, and I give thanks to God for my life. After they saw the miracle, my mother and all my brothers and sisters were converted. With such dramatic testimonies, hundreds began giving their hearts to Christ. When people saw that the gospel started changing lives, they started taking note. People started uh, uh, becoming more and more attracted to the gospel because they saw the, the transformation in individual lives. Now there are more than two dozen evangelical churches in Al Malanga, a town of just 19,000. Mariano Riscaje's El Calvario Church seats 1,200 and is nearly always packed. But the Holy Spirit's presence has not been measured by church growth alone. A walk through Al Malanga's bustling commercial district reveals the impact of the revival's social transformation. Streets and buildings are named after biblical places. If foreigners find this public display of faith extraordinary, Mariano sees it as perfectly natural. How can you say that you love God if you don't show it? Didn't Paul say, I am not ashamed of the gospel? Where once Al Malanga was peppered with bars or cantinas, 36 in all, now there are only three. And as the drinking stopped, so did the violence. For 20 years, the town's crime rate has declined steadily. 
In 1994, the last of Alma Longa's four jails closed. The remodeled building is now called the Hall of Honor. For Police Chief Santiago, these are the good times. You don't have any jails in town now? No, no, nothing. Because you don't need them? No, because there's no people that, that do trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, no, 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 even the town's agricultural base has come to life. For years, crop yields around Almalonga suffered from a combination of arid land and poor work habits. But as the people have turned to God, they have seen a remarkable transformation of their land. And Almalonga became a fertile valley. It is so fertile, that the land is so, so good. They produce the best vegetables. They get as many as three harvests per year. They sell their vegetables to Guatemala, south of Mexico, and El Salvador. Before the spiritual turnaround, growers were exporting four truckloads of produce a month. Now, they leave town 40 times a week. Nicknamed America's Vegetable Garden, Al Malanga's produce is of biblical proportions. You have to see them to believe. A bits is four and a half pounds. A carrot is this size. It is, it is just... Unbelievable. It, it's bigger than my heart. It's bigger than my heart. Oh, it's the green grocer. <laughs> Intrigued by the dimensions of these vegetables and the town's 1,000% increase in agricultural productivity, researchers from the U.S. and other foreign countries have come to Almalonga to learn their secret. But the answer is not what they expected. The, the wisdom that God gave the farmers in Almalonga produced better crops than uh, the scientific methods yielded. And um, uh, the farmers constantly give the glory to the Lord for uh, producing the, the bountiful harvest. Before, when we harvested the radish, it would take up to 60 days. But when God came into town, it only took 40. And now, quite often, it only takes 25 days to harvest. You can see a parallel between the people's faith in improving soil. At the same time people started believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the vegetables started growing. Once people were set free, they started working. Once they began to work, they gained financially. They started working the land better, and the land started producing better. Farmers pay cash for large Mercedes trucks, and then emblazon them with Christian phrases. It is, it is wonderful, and it is the, the result of the gospel transforming the community. Idolatry and superstition have fled, leaving behind a people dedicated to fervent worship and honest labor. Traditional stoicism has given way to heartfelt exuberance. Or what you have is 20 uh, Protestant churches, very active, very militant, and uh, very involved in praise, worship, deliverance, and so on and so forth. Despite their success, believers in Alma Longa have no intention of letting up. Many fast three times a week and continue to assault the forces of darkness through prayer and evangelism. As neighboring towns celebrate the Day of the Dead, the people of Alma Longa turn out in mass to honor the living God. The town's born-again mayor welcomed a crowd of almost 15,000 into the market square. They gathered to pray for a continued expansion of the gospel in their valley and around the world. The price we pay for this is holiness and consecration. Prayer and fasting gives us victories over principalities. It wasn't a theological preparation. It was simply throwing ourselves to the Lord. I think in many cases when we talk about community transformation, we have a battle with unbelief. Is our God and is the gospel powerful enough to truly impact our community? Al Malonga teaches us yes. You had a community given to idolatry, witchcraft, alcoholism, disruptive families, and now 
you have a community transformed. And that's a good picture to us that, yes, God can do it there, and he can do it in my community. God has lifted us, and we need to take advantage of this opportunity. We are a generation that God is going to use in the transformation, not only of our community, but the whole world. It is a beautiful spectacle to go and see the, the, the effect of the gospel, because you, you actually can see it. And that's what we want for our communities, for our cities, and for our nations. For the last hour, we followed the road to community transformation through neighborhoods on three continents. And along the way, our eyes have feasted on the handiwork of God in individual lives and entire social structures. And not one of these stories has been an aberration. Rather, uh, they're reflections of divine intent. They're the way things are supposed to be. Our journey has taught us that there are steps that we can and should be taking to position our communities for a visitation of the Holy Spirit. These include asking God to increase our appetite for the things that attract His presence, most notably unity and holiness and faith and humility. At the same time, we must cultivate a crop of persevering leaders whose collective vision for the community is watered by informed, sustained intercession. What God has done in Cali, Kiambu, Hemet, and Almalonga is indeed glorious, but it's only a hint of the story that is now breaking across the face of the earth. We lift up a shout, a victory shout, for we've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our mouth. In the name of the Lord, we lay down our lives that the triumph of Christ may resound in the earth. We lift up a shout, a victory shout, for we've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our mouth. We've declared war in the name of the Lord. Something is changing
few years ago, the Sentinel Group released a documentary video entitled Transformations. It highlighted the wonderful work of God in four distinct communities, communities whose only common attributes were dysfunction and despair. The video's reception around the world was both remarkable and gratifying. In thousands of cities, it stimulated a new hunger for prayer and unity. A few viewers, however, stumbled over the word transformation. They wondered how transformation could be claimed in places where social blemishes remain. But transformation is not synonymous with perfection. In this present fallen world, there are no perfect communities. Transformation is more accurately related to sanctification. It is both a state and a process. How we define a community depends on our perspective. Is the proverbial glass half full or half empty? I believe a community's distance from perfection is less important than the distance it has migrated from its former state. Community transformation is not about great meetings or even church growth. It is about the gospel making a tangible impact on society as a whole. How long the condition lasts depends upon the individual community. Our ministry here at the Sentinel Group is to sow seeds of hope, to inspire confidence in God, and to create a greater appetite for His presence. And I trust this coming presentation will do just that. Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Upon whom does his life not rise? What is man? that you are mindful of him. His name was Angotorzok. This happened a long time ago. It is not written. My grandfather told me under the stars. His name was Angwatizwak. He was the spiritual leader of our clan. He helped our people, the Inuit, form their thoughts. He told us when it was time to break camp and move on. We lived on the northern shore of the big island, the one the Anglos call Baffin. When Angwatizwak was getting to have hair like snow, he heard about God from an Inuk who had come up from the south. The Inuk spoke of a new belief of someone named Jisuzi. He said he was the son of God. At first, Angwatizwak did not understand what he heard, but he was curious, for his job was to explain spiritual mysteries to the people. And that is when the hidden things began to move inside himself. A vision came to him. He went on a long journey to search for truth. For a long time, he could find nothing. But one day, he found a place where the light and the dark came together. He could not go into the light or into the dark. So he climbed into a gap between them. He went up and up and up until he found a door. But he could not get in. And so he awoke from his dream. Angwatizwa could not understand this. He thought maybe the door would open if he followed the Inuk's God. A desire was burning inside him. 
and so he decided to give himself to this new faith. There is an Inuit way. When the people want to give their whole heart into something, they make a ritual. So Angwatizwak thought he would kill a seal so that the people might share its meat and its blood together. That is when he told his people, I've made a choice. I'm going to go out to hunt seal. If I catch one tonight, I'm going to give my life, and I'm going to practice this ritual. But if I don't catch anything, I'm not going to do it. There was no moon, no stars that night, just heavy clouds. So Angwatizwak knew it would be hard to find Zeal, but he wanted to do it. So he went out onto the frozen ocean to look for a breathing hole. Even in the dark, he found one. But the seal was not there. He had to wait. It was very cold, so he built a little wall of ice to protect from the wind. Then he sat down and made his harpoon ready to strike the seal. But after some time the seal didn't come, he fell asleep. While Angwatizwak was sleeping, the dream came again. He saw it until one time his head became heavy and he woke up. When he opened his eyes, he looked down at the breathing hole. There was something different. He realized he could see his shadow. Something very strange on a moonless winter night. Suddenly the area began to get brighter and brighter. And that was when he saw them. Aguatizwak saw three beings that looked like they had wings. Wings! They were coming down from out of the clouds. They did not speak. But Aguatizwak knew why they had come. As soon as they left, a seal came out of the hole. Angwatizwak put the harpoon into it and dragged it back to the camp. The people were still sleeping. Later, they came out of their tents and igloos and shared that seal. That is when Angwatizwak and his people started to follow Jisuasi. Many years later, the missionaries came and told us the whole story about God and his son as it is written in the great book. And we knew it was so. We are all his, I am descendants of him. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Canada's Eastern Arctic is divided into two primary domains. Nunavut, the country's newest self-governing territory, and Nunavik, an Inuit homeland in northern Quebec. Together, the region encompasses more than 2.7 million square kilometers. Remarkably, this vast and frigid landscape is inhabited by less than 30,000 natives. For hundreds of years, they traveled in clans. They had no collective voice. At these latitudes, the land is so cold that even trees refuse to grow. But it is the inner barrenness that does the real damage. For decades, the Inuit have struggled to find their identity. Robbed of any sense of place and purpose, many communities have spiraled toward the abyss. There was this great void. So many from that generation, they turned to alcohol. They lost their culture, so it, there was a lot of shame. For this town, it was like dark, dark, dark. It was like a nightmare. Uh, it was awful. It was very awful. I remember when people would die, we would go for morning and morning. You know, we would be sad because we have no hope. This is Kanyak in northern Quebec. And we have about maybe um, around 500 people here. Annie Tertuluk has lived on Quebec's remote Ungava Peninsula since 1964. As Annie and her husband Mark know all too well, alcohol became a troublesome companion to many Inuit. We were one of the worst um, couple in town because we were young and we were 
drinking. When my heart uh, was beating fast after drinking, I could hear uh, trouble was waiting for me. I think the whole community was drinking at that time. I remember one time that the whole community was drunk. When we receive our booths in the community all together, oh, you would hear people shouting there. I lost my brother because of alcohol. People shouting here. I lost a lot of friends. People fighting here. It was tearing up my life. It was bad. Oh my goodness, it was terrible. There were no laws. The frozen north was more like the wild west. No police. Life was dangerous. No rules in the community. Our community was really uh, sleepless people with all the crimes that we had. Women and children had little protection. Oh, we had wife abuse, spouse also. My husband, he, he beat me. Um, It's really hard that time. Like many Inuit women, Ayuka Pinguatuk has had to balance relationships with the tasks of Arctic survival. It has not been easy. I came a Christian when he was a hunter, and he beat me for this. Sexual assaults were another consequence of the ever-present booze. Ayuka's daughter, Alice, remembers the fear that attached itself to every young woman. We had to protect ourselves from uh, sexual abuse. When I was young, I, I was raped. That guy was drunk, and after that, I was shamed. And I didn't like men. That was awful. My life was awful. The wounds were deep and often reopened. Okay. Nobody really talked about abuse or the hurts of the heart, of the emotions that. Uh, I used to wish someone would talk to me, but nobody did. To cover their pain, many young people turned to drugs, alcohol, and heavy metal music. Others simply walked through the door of no return. I had a big mirror in my room, and I draw demons. I have a sister. She was 22 when she killed herself. She hung herself. On the Hudson Bay side of Arctic Quebec, the community of Povanatuk, or POV as the locals call it, has its own story to tell. It did not start well. By the summer of 1991, conditions in this isolated outpost were so grave that a CBC television crew was flown in to investigate. Their disturbing findings were aired that September on Canada's national news magazine, The Journal. Something is happening in Pavonatuk, a cluster of teenage suicides and self-inflicted wounds. The story, entitled Deadly Summer, ran for nearly 17 minutes. The eighth teenage suicide of the year, an appalling statistic. More than 20 times the Canadian average. Harry Tuluga, father of five. So the first thing that comes to mind is, oh no, what, what can we do? Why? Why? I was here for the total horror that was felt and expressed at the time. And outside the arcade each morning, the local drugs of choice, solvents and lubricants. We had an enormous epidemic of suicide of youth. The death certificates coldly codify the toll of this awful year. It seemed like there was one suicide every month. Then came the realization that a lot of our children were experiencing sexual abuse. Every single family was touched. It was total darkness at the time. And the scene in POV was no different than any other northern community. 
even the land turned its back on its inhabitants. In many areas of the eastern Arctic, caribou, fish, and berries, once abundant, began to disappear. For a people already living on the edge, the situation was perilous. People were depressed, actually. We were sort of lost in a way. Looks like our community was cursed. While it appeared to some that God had abandoned Anguatizawak's descendants, in truth, God was the one seeking to reestablish the relationship. Just 60 years after God revealed his glory to Anguatizawak, he sent a second emissary to the Eastern Arctic, and this one had a name. Canon John Turner. He got this Bible when he was at college. The notes John Turner left in his Bible are revealing. Except a man forsake all, underline, that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Turner began his ministry among the Inuit in the late 1920s. In God's providence, his assignment took him to the very shores where Anguatizawak had led his people into a new covenant. Only two institutions preceded Turner's arrival in Pond Inlet, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Hudson's Bay Company. But the tiny community would become an important spiritual beachhead. Joan Hobart was living in John Turner's hometown in England when she first met him. He was home on furlough and spoke at her church. His stories of the Arctic were riveting. As a young Bible student, Joan was in awe of this man of God. My friend said, I think, I think he's interested in you. I said, oh, no, he's, he's a well-seasoned missionary, you know. But he was interested. He said, will you come and join life up there? And I said, yes. But the missions board said no. Arctic living was too harsh and no place for a woman. John went back without her. Joan would wait in faith. Three years passed without a single letter from the North. Then one day, a telegram. Permission granted. Bring ring, cake, and wedding dress. The trip was dangerous. The world was at war. German U-boats were patrolling the North Atlantic. The last leg of the two-month journey was aboard a supply steamer called the Nascope. The vessel stopped only once each year to offload food and mail. It was a long journey to the middle of nowhere, all based on a single telegram and a lot of faith. I was a bit nervous because I thought, now suppose he comes and doesn't really want me. And so I went downstairs into the saloon. I said, well, I think I'll marry the first one, the first man that comes aboard. So fortunately, Jack came in a little rowboat and came and found me. So I think it turned out all right. She and Jack, as she called him, were married that afternoon. They spent their honeymoon in an igloo they built together. As a newlywed, Joan learned how to use a coal stove, how to melt ice to make water, and how to make a home at 40 below. I had to learn how to cook seal. I wasn't good at it at the beginning. <laughs> oh, dear. Childbirth and medical care were strictly home style for the nearest hospital was too far. John Turner's love for the Inuit is clearly seen in his personal movies, and the love was reciprocated. Here was an Angelo who wore the ways of the North like a second skin. Local elders say he became more Inuit than the Inuit. He learned their language and translated the scriptures. He taught school using the Bible as his text. Most remarkable of all, were John Turner's epic missionary expeditions. Traveling by sledge and often alone, he scattered spiritual seed across a parish larger than most nations. A seven month journey in the winter of 1938 to 39 covered an astonishing 3,000 miles. Turner's church in Pond Inlet was the first of its kind, a vibrant ministry that continues to the present day. Every day was special to her because that's the first time she had known about Bible and prayer. 
Lydia was a little girl when Canon John Turner taught her the gospel. Fifty years later, the precious truths still bubble up in song. Cornelius Newtigak grew up with memories of a coming glory. John used to say to us, there's a life after death. It is very beautiful, and it's called heaven. Turner was God's man in the Arctic, but the heaven he preached of was not so far away. The gun went off, and he fell back. Arriving home from a hunting trip, he saw a child struggling with a heavy load of ice. As he bent down to help, his shotgun slid off his shoulder and fired. It went up here into the back of his head. The effort to get Turner to a hospital made international headlines. Soldiers parachuted in with medicine to stabilize the badly wounded minister. As paralysis set in, Joan was John's nurse day and night, bathing him, turning him, giving injections. She had two toddlers and was nearly eight months pregnant. It would be weeks before the ice could support the landing of a rescue plane. The restless and hungry soldiers were now added to Joan's burden. I went into Jack and I said, oh, I just can't do this anymore. I'm so tired. And I began to cry, I think. And he said, well, they are my guests. We must do what we can for them. When John Turner had nothing left to give, he gave a little more. Weeping Inuit besieged the Turners as they set out for the frozen lake. Although John could barely speak, he led them in prayer. Shortly thereafter, Canon John Turner died in a Winnipeg hospital. Three weeks after his funeral, his third daughter was born. Joan named her Faith. I found my dad's Bible the other day in my mom's bookshelf. And, uh, Although Faith I never just, met her I father, he is no it's stranger. I just was flipping through it, and I, I, I came across this that he'd written at the back. And I determined henceforth I would seek no appropriation but that of God. Did I ever start on a life of happiness and holiness? But from that day until now, I've been content to live alone with God. And I just saw in it what my father's heart was like to just, you know, go after what God has spoken to him. John Turner died long before he went to the Arctic. He knew that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That was his vision. Joan has seen it too. I had a vision once of all the young people coming through the streets, singing hymns and things. It, oh, in a vision, it will work one day. Yeah, it will come to pass. Like many in the Pond Inlet community, James Ariak sees himself as a spiritual descendant of Anguatizawak and a spiritual disciple of John Turner. The planting of the word occurred into our parents. And our parents, through the planting of the seed, bore fruit. Back in February 1996, something happened. Throughout Pond Inlet, small groups of intercessors were pounding heaven with prayers for revival. Providing inspiration for this assault were two men with big hearts and worn out knees, Arctic evangelist Billy Arnacook and local pastor Moses Kayak. That's when the people were convicted and were drawn uh, to the Lord in a great numbers. And uh, they were so convicted that they, had to, they felt they had to clean their houses. The dirt paths leading to John Turner's old church were suddenly congested with desperate townspeople. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to get rid of their illicit drugs, pornography, and heavy metal music. It was coming in like a flood. We had a big can, garbage can, right in front of the altar every night. They kept filling it up and filling it up. Every night, they went to the dump and burned them up. 
After five nights, the town dump was full. As community leaders considered incinerating the remaining items, they received encouragement from an unlikely source, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had a bonfire uh, right about here where the iceberg is. The Mounties even provided logistical support. Five gallons. They said we can even provide gas to burn up the junk. Nearly the entire community turned out for the burn. <laughs> According to the RCMP, the value of illicit property destroyed during the revival was a staggering 80 to $100,000. It was a deep repentance. The Holy Spirit himself was speaking to the people. The whole community was completely transformed. The afterglow of this momentous occasion warmed hearts for months to come. But it also hinted at a fire yet unrealized, a fire so remarkable it would be talked about half a world away. February 28th. It happened in the middle of winter, February 28th, 1999. Believers had gathered for a week of revival meetings at the Anglican Church. Hungry for God and troubled by new reports of community drug use, they decided to add a special Sunday afternoon youth service. Among those leading the meeting were Pastor Moses Kayak and his ministerial colleagues Joshua and James Ariak all great-grandsons of the original lightkeeper, Angwatizawak. An invitation was offered for youth who felt they wanted to come closer to God. Worship leader Louis Ariak was praying over the youth that had gathered around the altar. I felt so close to God, and he kept giving me this verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Something started to happen that uh, was out of our control. This uh, noise started coming. Yeah, it started softly, like you can barely hear it. A dual cassette deck used to record the service was still running off the soundboard. Right away, I wanted it stopped, but it kept getting louder, and, and I started to notice that people were kind of getting a little nervous. It was so strong, so strong. It was so loud that everything started to shake. Fire went right through me. It sounded like a jet. Things started to shake. I started to shake. I told myself, there's no jets in Pond Benoit. After this extraordinary visitation, it was evident the moment still had power. Every time I thought about it, I, I was uh, greatly humble. Uh, thinking, thinking that uh, the Almighty God can visit us. When Pastor Moses Kayak first heard the low-pitched rumbling, he walked over to the church soundboard to adjust the settings. I tried this, not stop, tried this, no stop. When these efforts failed to correct the situation, he quickly turned down the master control. When this too failed, he shut the system off completely. Still, the sound and the recording continued. It shouldn't have been recorded. It's only by the miracle of God. Came into the town. He was completely humbled to the point where he wanted to continually come before God, kneel, and ask for prayer, and ask for the cleansing of the heart to become pure before him. The same Holy Spirit that graced Pond Inlet has also been visiting other communities in the Eastern Arctic. 
One of them, the tiny hamlet of Opaluk, is situated on Ungava Bay in northeastern Quebec. Established in 1978, the community quickly became known as a place of sorrows. There have been a lot of tragedy. This person suicide himself. He was about 17 years old. There was another a girl, 19 years old, who also had suicide. What we did was we pray for our community. We broke the curse in our community. The results were both immediate and tangible. I see that our community, it changed. I find since our prayer that time, we are set free. We're happy now. <laughs> School teacher Maggie Apatuk is the proverbial human dynamo, bearing witness of Christ's love at every opportunity. Since I'm a Christian, I always want to share my heart to the children. I always ask them, do you have a savior in your heart? The influence of the gospel in Opaluk's classrooms is pervasive and powerful. We start with the Lord's Prayer this morning. Sylvie Susie is a secular contract teacher from Southern Canada. I think most children here are pretty religious. According to Maggie, that may be an understatement. All of them are safe. All of them are born again. That's 40% of Opaluk's current population and its entire future. Things are also on the upswing over in POV. Longtime resident and local pastor Elias e. Salualuk is a happy witness to the change. In 1996, uh, this community was, was really revived, uh, really revived by the Lord. The whole community was really amazing. Once again, an important key was fervent, united prayer. Having a heart open to God, that was all it took. And then came the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the community. And the wailing, the wailing in the churches. The pain, the pain. The travail rose as incense before God. And the heavens opened. We were seeing results, a lot of results, good results. Suicide has completely gone on the downtrend. In fact, crime at all levels has diminished. But we have an all-forgiving and almighty God, and families have been healing over these past six, seven years now. It's been wonderful to see the movement of God in our community. While it is tempting to stop and celebrate God's work in POV and Opaluk, the story does not end here. And it's wonderful to see how God is moving, not just in POV, in all communities. Since people started to get saved, oh, it's a different story. My slate is clean because of Jesus. See, God is saving these people we never thought could be changed. I found him. He's a big guy. I really found him, he's a big guy. Hearts and relationships have been mended. I've seen men get up and publicly repent that I have abused my children and, and I've abused my wife. My husband, he's helped me right now. We are, he's really changed his life. Many people have been healed from those wounds, especially women. God is using them today. God is just changing communities. Jesus was the answer to all their problems. Whole communities, it's amazing. Uh, not every community in the Arctic is at the same level, but I don't think there's any community now where something is not happening. Everything, uh, it changed. It completely changed. It's spreading everywhere. The fire of the Lord is spreading. You can visit every community and you can like tell you the same story. Kwaktek and Tsukot. So, Kwaktek and Kujuak. Aupaluk. Kubungzuk. And also the Bay. Pride River. Arctic Bay. Arctic Bay. Like Copper. The Tiriak is starting. Copper. And Tiriak is starting. Oh. 
what I see is beautiful. <laughs> the gospel has also begun to infiltrate the political arena. According to longtime Arctic missionary Roger Armbruster, God is raising up a new generation of native leaders that is not shy about declaring the lordship of Christ. This mace is made of a Norwell tusk. Now, this is the symbol of the authority of the Nunavut legislature that's brought into the legislature every time they meet to do official business. And it's written on paper inside this mace, the prayer from the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some mayors I know of open their council chambers for prayer meetings twice a week. I know that without God on this meeting, it's not going to be good. So he's always included in everything. As the Bible says, when the righteous rules, the people rejoice. God has even touched the land itself. The land is, is starting to produce and become productive. 20 years ago, there was no caribou. And since that time, the, the caribou's are coming back here. Even fishing the lakes were starting to grow. Even the land is starting to produce some little plants. We are so blessed. <laughs> A hope that once invaded the heart of a solitary seal hunter is now on display in churches, classrooms, and council chambers across the eastern Arctic. It is a reminder that the love of God is not only deep and persistent, it is also purposeful. Isn't it like God to take a part of the earth that man would despise and say, well, what value is that frozen Arctic tundra? And God says, I'm going to use that part of the earth to glorify myself. I had a vision once of all the young people coming through the streets, singing and praising the Lord. It will work one day. It will come to pass. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. For I can hear that thunder in the desert. Like a train on the edge of the town I can feel the brooding of your spirit Lay your burdens down Lay your burdens down the Revival is not only uh, biblical, but uh, believe in revival because it is historical and God has done it in history and because it is communal, it changes communities. And it is practical, it changes people, it makes people new. And it is spiritual, it, it changes the whole spiritual tone, eliminating sin and, and crime. It, it's just logically the thing that is necessary. Let your rain fall in this day. Societal transformation at a regional level is unusual, but it is no aberration. As history reveals, it will occur whenever and wherever God's Spirit is given room. Like the High Arctic, Scotland's remote outer Hebrides echo with tales of the supernatural. And like the far north, this rocky, windswept armada seems an improbable place for God to visit. Yet the heavens have been rent over this ancient land with remarkable regularity. These visitations have been called revivals, but they are unlike anything most of us have ever experienced. History records gatherings of 9,000 people, but that's difficult to take in because there were only 12,000 people in the island. In 1949, the presence of God descended yet again, this time in the parish of Barbas, the refreshing was certainly needed, but it did not come easily. Religious pride and legalism had created deep divisions within the church. Some clergymen refused to believe that God could do a great work that did not begin with them. When the refreshing did come, they opposed it bitterly. There was such tremendous opposition from the largest denomination. Mary Peckham was a teenager when the revival broke out but she can still remember the spiritual coolness that preceded it. The spiritual temperature in the island before the revival was religious, but uh, certainly not lively. It was a spiritual winter. Not everyone was ready to bundle up. 
revival is something that uh, when you've experienced it, you always want to see it again. One revival era convert, a godly store clerk by the name of Donald John Smith, recalls how local intercessors went to work. People were praying all the time for this revival. They would be praying in the barns. You would hear them pray. Among the more fervent of these prayer warriors were two elderly sisters, one of them nearly blind, praying for revival several times a week, often late into the night. They were gripped by the promise of Isaiah 44. I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams upon the dry ground. One of them was housebound. She was in bed there. I used to read the Bible with them and pray with them. And you would feel the presence of the Lord. They knew the Lord. Challenged by the faith of these godly women, seven church leaders gathered in a nearby barn to pray. For months, they pled with God that he might kindle a greater appetite for his presence. That was the defining moment of the beginnings of the revival. It was 1949, in the middle of the year. As the elders continued their travail in the barn, they began to notice the lights in nearby crofts and farmhouses burning late into the night. Some never went out at all. The people's hunger for God had overtaken their desire for sleep. The elders realized their prayers had been answered. It was a community at prayer. Their faces would be tear-stained. There was such an expectancy, such a desire. And these prayers were travailing. They were painful praying. Such a longing that God would come. And uh, God answered. With nothing more to delay him, Jehovah drew near. Something very significant had happened the previous night. There was something quite strange, almost eerie, in the atmosphere of the house. We felt this power, and uh, afterwards, even the dishes were clattering. It was as if uh, the Lord came down with a mighty wind. The house shook with the power of prayer and the presence of the Lord. And people were afraid because this was a supernatural happening. The Shekinah glory of God descended upon the community. A tangible, supernatural light hovering around many of the farmhouses. There was lights coming on houses. The glory of the Lord was just shining around about them. They were all stunned. They couldn't say a word. What could they say? Be still and know that I am God. That's always it. Around 4 o'clock in the morning, a crowd of several hundred people gathered outside the community police station. Many had traveled from neighboring villages, drawn by an incomprehensible power. Walking on the main road, they would be kind of to God to have mercy on them. They were lying down on the road for God to have mercy on them. It was as if we were suddenly in eternity. Eternal issues, eternal things were, were very, very real to us. A key figure in the unfolding revival was the Reverend Duncan Campbell, a fiery preacher with the United Free Church. He would storm up and down the pulpit. The perspiration would run down his face. Oh, my dear people, listen. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The meeting halls were packed. Just as many unbelievers came, many uh, all over the island they were coming. The church was crowded to capacity. People sat in the windows. Just as many outside. Oh, yes. Just as many outside. You can make a community crusade conscious, the fiery revivalist would say, but only God can make a community God conscious. You see, the presence of God puts to flight program. Not an evangelist, not a special effort, not anything at all organized on the basis of human endeavor, but an awareness of God that gripped the whole community. Soon the moving of God's spirit was felt on other islands, including Harris, Bernera, and Tyree. But it was the revival on North Uist that Jean Blanchard remembers best. The year was 1957. There was an awareness of God's 
power working throughout the island. People were being saved every night. Lives were being transformed. We could only say, God came by. As news of the revival spread, several reporters showed up on the island around Christmas time. Upon arriving at their hotel, they were promptly escorted into the bar by the local proprietor. Look, he said, all this alcohol is here. He said, the people are not coming. They're going to the meetings. The revival meetings had just spoiled their sales. Similar complaints were heard all over the islands. Lifestyle was changed, sorry. there's no doubt about that. The drinking houses of the village, they gradually disappeared one by one with the power of the revival. It affected the whole community. You couldn't be indifferent to what was happening. It was as if there was a canopy of an awareness of God over the whole island. There was a complete transformation. And the people in the world knew it. God had come. That was the answer. Having observed God's willingness to transform discrete territories and cultures, only one question remains. Can this happen at a national level? Is there any evidence of God at work in a modern state, a sovereign nation? The East African nation of Uganda seems an unlikely place to look for answers. Racked with demonic fevers, this one-time Pearl of Africa has spent decades in a deep spiritual coma. Its very name has become synonymous with death. As the nursery of AIDS, and as Idi Amin's personal house of horrors. I think Uganda has been a country of pain, a country which has gone through one military coup to another. I know what it means to live in fear. Pastor John Malindi was a teenager when the horror began. People have been killed in, in, in thousands, massacres, whole villages being massacred. And sometimes you would not know exactly who is doing the killing. Those who listen to John Melindy's vivid tales may squirm. His body lay there for two days. Or even weep. And the baby had pulled out the breast of a dead mother. But they will second. always remember. We did not recognize what we were fighting against. Uganda's history, like that of many African nations, is filled with magic practices and secret rituals. Fetishes known as Mayembe were everywhere and kings, even to the days of Idi Amin, are known to have offered human sacrifices. Africans are covenant people, if I may say. Much of what we have is covenanted to the devil. Our history tells us that our ancestors worship other gods other than the god of Abraham. For Uganda, the consequence of this idolatry has been a long season of fear and pain. What I knew about Idi Amin was a towering figure with the, who wanted to throw around his weight and wanted his presence felt all over. Journalist and, uh, Mark Kukuza grew up under the shadow of Uganda's infamous tyrant. Like many of his countrymen, he was optimistic when Amin's overthrow led to the return of former president Milton Obote. But they thought that maybe Obote would be better than Idi Amin, but it wasn't. There were powers of darkness behind these people that you're looking at, which were tearing apart this nation. In those days, it was common to find bodies lying by the roadside, and sometimes people would go to look over just to make sure, is it a person I know, a loved one? If not, they would just go on. And it wasn't just soldiers doing the killing. I was born to die. Pastor Jackson Sinyanga was just three months old when his mother threw him into the garbage. And uh, my grandma picked me up. Assuming he would die within a matter of days, an aunt agreed to take him in. But the boy lived, if only to revisit the pain. My father was murdered uh, in 79 during Idi Amin. And uh, at the funeral, that's when I first saw the picture or the face of my mother, never a letter, never a picture, no nothing. And I was already a teenager. Sadly, Jackson's father was part of a national epidemic. One day passed, two days without your loved one coming home. Then you know, maybe, maybe he's, a, he's dead. So the first place to go to would be Namave Forest. It was a forest of death. 
You could feel the spirit of death there, the heaviness of death. Come on, come back. I will never know. Prayer meetings went underground. Pastors circulated between as many as 10 groups a day, always at great peril, and often arriving home in the wee hours. The soldiers had power to do whatever they want. There would be road checks. I was stopped in road checks many times, and you would never know how you're going to come out. On one occasion, a mother traveling with an infant was asked for the baby's identity papers. And of course, the babies don't have identity papers, and the baby was snatched from her, thrown up into the air, and the soldier raised a knife, and the baby came and plunged on that knife. And by 1984, they began killing churchmen. They began killing pastors. Pastor Jotham Mutebi was in the middle of a sermon when Amin's soldiers burst into his church with guns blazing. As the bullets tore through the sanctuary, several elderly women rose and made their way to the altar. And when I saw them, I thought these people were so desperate and that they needed comfort. So I raised up my arms and uh, prayed over them. But I came to learn later that the reason they came, they wanted to die with me, their pastor. Instead, Pastor Mutebi and his parishioners were herded into hijacked trucks and taken to the dreaded Nakasero Center. Just a few uh, meters away from where we are was this Nakasero State Research Bureau. That was the torture chambers. The sadism and violence were unspeakable. They could put 60 people in a room that is just by uh, three by three meters, and they're crammed in to the point that a person would die and stay upright, held up by the bodies of the other living ones. There were no investigations. Things would happen, and that would be the end of it. It seemed the entire world had turned its back on the horrors in Uganda. Men have deserved us. Millions died the bodies clogging the Owen Falls Dam and the shores of nearby Lake Victoria. We need to repent for whatever sins of our past. We defile our country. We are not any better than Cain. This preoccupation with killing took its toll on the nation's economy and infrastructure. The factories broke down, essential com commodities became scarce and almost unknown. You couldn't get soap, you couldn't get anything. The city was dirty and uh, most of your buildings were damaged. The morals of the people were so broken that you could not get a single thing done without having to pay for it. Just when it seemed things could not get any worse, they did. This time, the news was delivered by the World Health Organization. It was being predicted that by 1997, AIDS would be so bad in Uganda that one third of the population will have died. Dr. Patrobus Mufubenga is an accomplished physician serving with Uganda's National Institute of Health. During this time, everybody was desperate. Uh, all of us, we are losing our dear ones. Uganda has been crying to God, just like the voice was heard in Lama, women crying for their sons. The pain, the suffering, the sorrow, the fear, no one could console. They developed a saying before that said uh, that the God of Uganda had gone to sleep. In the middle of the night, there's one old man who stood up and pointed his cane to the pastors and said, where is this God you preach about? The God of power, the God who answers prayer. What has Uganda done to God? It looks like God hates us. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. And they began praying day and night, day and night, day and night. It came through a lot of crying, a lot of waiting. There were times he had, they had to go into the swamps and stay in the water, hidden in the papyrus reeds. So they would spend the whole day there, and in the night they would come out. And they would, they would then get together and pray. 
This was deep, groaning prayer. I am the man who has seen affliction. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. I'll choose to seek God until he answers prayer. If he's not going to answer, then I'd rather die seeking him. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And the presence of God would come down as the people cried out to God, and it would be manifest to the physical eye like a cloud, a heavy cloud of mist hanging over the people. When you walk into the meeting, you, you are immediately swallowed in. You know you are entering something that is tangible. Fifteen years ago, this was one of the most dangerous places in all of Uganda. This community was known as the Beirut of Kampala because under the regime of Milton Abote, undisciplined soldiers used to use the homes and shops in this area for target practice. Hopelessness hung over this community like a wet blanket. It was into this place that God led a young Ugandan evangelist by the name of Robert Kayanja. He was accompanied by six intercessors. This is our wailing wall where we used to pray. I Besides to contending with lawless soldiers, Robert's team was also confronted by a powerful witch doctor named Musoki. I mean, there was kind of a fear that walked with this man. After being threatened with death, the intercessors cried out to God. Within days, it was Musoki who was dead. After the death of this uh, famous witch, Musoki, we begin to see the heavens open. Kayanja's tiny congregation became a vast multitude. The Miracle Center Cathedral now seats 10,000 people, and the fellowship has given birth to 600 daughter congregations. Uganda, which had been written off by many, many countries, whose economy had totally collapsed, which had no voice at all, and whose people were ashamed of being called Ugandans, began making a turn around. And the healing process began. Not surprisingly, it is a change fueled by prayer. So churches began to pray in zones. It's like bees. You can hear bees through the night. Every community praying, every zone praying. And I felt like, you know what? The enemy must find another city, but not Kampala. Unity is another hallmark of the present revival. The work that God has been doing in this land cannot be claimed by any individual or any church or any ministry. Citywide pastors gatherings are common. God is calling us now together to pray together, to praise together. It is really happening that God is bringing churches together. To talk to each other, to appreciate one another. What I'm trying to do is to go with those people who love Jesus who preach the word of God. Sometimes you find me in Pentecostal churches. I do go there. The body of Christ is coming together. I am overwhelmed. The revival we are involved in now is for everybody. And unity is not something we're praying for, but something we are thanking God for. Even the dire World Health Organization report on AIDS did not shake the believer's confidence in God. We have seen the AIDS virus healed. And the doctors go, wow, I can't explain this, but there must be a God up there somewhere. I had chest pain, I had the skin rash. I started vomiting. These were terminal cases. I lost the appetite. I couldn't eat. People with full-blown AIDS. I grew very, very thin as a poor. After being prayed for, many sensed oh, God's God. touch. That there is something changing that, that, that very moment, that very night. The power of God came down, and I felt it. Not surprisingly, these self-proclaimed healings elicited serious skepticism from medical caregivers. Why have you bothered yourself to come here? Because your status and your appearance shows that you are a victim. But in time, this skepticism turned to amazement. My doctor looked at me. He was amazed. He said, hey, 
Are you still living? Bank Veda. I was checked. There's no AIDS. They read my name, Ruth Bidabwa, HIV negative. And they told me you are HIV negative, nano-reactive. There's no virus in your body. Then the rest of the symptoms start to disappear one by one. God had healed me totally. It and was a refrain now, heard thousands of times across Uganda. But as I talk to you right now, I have experienced over 372 AIDS patients being healed. Uganda has been recorded as one of the first countries to see a decline in HIV. We believe it's because of our prayer and we believe it's because of the love and the grace of God. It is also because Uganda has promoted abstinence and faithfulness as their primary weapons against AIDS. I vowed before you that if you heal me, I'll tell all the people. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The power of God has also been manifested in the political arena. I believe Uganda is in a new beginning politically. In divine timing, God wrote leadership. God began to put people in place. God is working in this country. Paul Atiang has held nearly every post in Uganda's government, including prime minister. The Lord has always been with me. But it's the Lord who makes character. Beatrice Bayenka is a member of parliament from the Hoima district. So I want to, to be more firm in everything that I do and so that the light may so shine. They expect us to reflect Christ. And Stephen Unyo is the nation's deputy police commissioner. I'm one of those who believe that God must talk to me, especially in this type of job I am. On a number of occasions, Unyo has seen God quell violent riots in answer to prayer. And I believe out of my personal experience, children of God, if we continue in prayer, there is nothing impossible. But I've taken my faith up to the governmental level. Cecilia Adam Ogwal is the fiery leader of Uganda's parliamentary opposition. Uh, I am an ambassador of Christ. And I'm not ashamed to testify that anywhere I go. As we saw the government changing and the spiritual realm being changed, we felt, you know what? The God of Uganda has not gone to sleep yet. The gospel has introduced new changes even in the structure of the government. Now we have a new ministry called the Ministry of Ethics and Integrity. We never used to have that. God put me in this position. God needed a tough person for a tough assignment. And when I was tussling with getting born again, I told him, I want you to get me hold of me like you did with Saul on the way to Damascus. And he did it. Miriam Matembe remembers the day she stood before the president and his cabinet to explain her portfolio. Her words were prophetic. Do you remember the story of the children of the Israelites in the slavery and how Moses led them from the promised land? Ah, here I am. I'm the Moses of Uganda. The Lord has appointed me here to lead Uganda from UNESCO conduct moral decadency, corruption to the right direction. As the source of the river that once carried a younger Moses to his destiny, Uganda is again on the highway to history. And the journey is nowhere more evident than in the government's aggressive plan to build ethics and integrity in public office. I knew that the battle is very hard and difficult, but the Lord is with me. Today there's a lot of corruption in Uganda, but if we look back to how it was 15 years ago, it's just incomparable. Judge Julia Sabutendi is a special prosecutor appointed by the president, a fervent Christian. Her corruption-free reputation has brought new energy and credibility to the campaign. What she has unearthed has shocked the whole nation, and people are trembling, big shots. The first are four to refresh our memory, talk to us. She is what she is, is because she's born again, because she has stood her ground. And to see that today people are coming back to this place of integrity is amazing. We have seen God do great things until crime rate drops 50%. Not surprisingly, this new attitude is impacting the national economy. While things are still tough, positive signs are everywhere. 
uh, the economy, which was predicted to collapse, has not collapsed as such, but it has been among the three fastest growing economies in Africa. And Uganda's churches are growing even faster than her economy. And we went from seven people to 2,000 people in two weeks. Not bad for a young man who was once tossed onto a garbage heap. Today, it's amazing. We have five services on Sunday morning, and uh, we're averaging about 20,000 people. And today, I'll tell you, our church is not the only church that God's growing. And there is revival, immense, immense revival going on within our churches. Every day in Uganda, there is a new church starting up or a ministry starting up. Once we have set ourselves free from the sin of our past, then we need to focus on the purpose of God. On New Year's Eve, 1999, Uganda joined the rest of the world in celebrating the arrival of a new millennium. But there was a special character to the Ugandan celebration. His is the invisible hand that has moved us along and shaped our destiny. Ten weeks earlier, First Lady Janet Museveni had invited several church leaders to a meeting. So when she came in, she told us she had a vision. As we to the new millennium, can't we organize a time of thanksgiving to God for the way God has got us through this period? I mean, she had re requested that we dedicate the nation officially back to God. Good morning to all of you. And happy New Year. So in the presence of the President and First Lady, we covenanted the nation to God for the next 1,000 years. The covenant, which included the signatures of the President and First Lady, was remarkably explicit. We are conscious that we have put on other words before you and worship It read like a passage out of the Old Testament. Covenanting our nation, Uganda, to the purposes of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Then the king called together all the people from the least to the greatest. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. From beginning to end, it was just God. Watching these fervent assemblies, one is confronted with a glorious irony. Dictators once tried to destroy the nation's faith by preventing people from entering church buildings. Instead, the edicts and padlocks served only to remind believers that the church has nothing to do with buildings. When Uganda's faith was taken outdoors, into football stadiums, banks, hotels, even parliamentary offices, it flourished. Jesus is standing on the right hand telling the Father, Father, I'm ready for Uganda. And Uganda that was once used to be the pearl of Africa was now about ready to shine again. It's amazing for people who lived at that time to see what is happening now. Life has come. As soon as there is, there is a new king reigning over the nation of Uganda. Uganda is ready for God as a nation. It's astounding. It really is a miracle. Nobody can deny it. It wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the Lord. To those who would ask, why did God move so powerfully in these particular regions, the answer is simple. He was invited. And I think a spirit of revival walks in a country. 
it, is, it must be invited. It must, people must desire to have that spirit. It's the kind of desire that deeply yearns to the, to the Lord. People are praying and they're seeking God as the realization that the only way out of this mess is God coming upon us and God cleaning up society and God making all things new. We must humble ourselves unto the mighty hand of God first. We can only move the spirit by our prayer. There's no other way. Let there be prayer in every area of the land, in every town, in every village, in every church. Lord, we need to come. We can't do it on our own, but come to us, come visit us. There's a price to pay for our survivor. There's prayer, there's tears, tears of repentance. Father, my God, we pray that you carry out this surgery in the hearts of the people, Lord. Our heart matters to God more than anything else. Remove the heart of stubbornness, the heart of unbelief. He is really attracted to pure hearts. And Father, give us the heart of flesh that loves you, Lord my God. God will listen to the prayers of his people, fervent prayers. He listen to them. He'll hear you. And you will know the faithfulness of God. Since we got to know Jesus personally, God makes a big difference. Now we have hope. Miracles have been happening in this country and we believe Uganda will never be the same again. Oh, God is so good. I have seen this community just transform by the power of God, really. There's going to be a time when the whole world is going to experience nations coming to maturity, nations coming to the fullness of their purposes. That time is so near. God promised in his word that in this last day he's going to pour out his spirit in a greater way. Every baby laying on the bedroom floor. Every dreamer dreaming in the dead end job. Every driver driving through the rush hour. When you are praying, don't, don't back up. 
pray until something happens. Press it forward until something happens. The message is, don't slumber. Rise up and lift up the standard of prayer in the land. Press on to the end. Revival is something that, uh, when you've experienced it, you always want to see it again.